It's ladies' night. Lux Fordians are doing all right. Oh, what a, what a stupid song. Hello. Welcome to all our loyal live viewers here at the Blue Board Tavern. Welcome. We're brought to you by the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. Remember, uh, you can chat amongst yourself with the chat button at your tables. Questions and answers, as usual. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but we've, we're seeing a new phenomenon here. Hey, everyone. Hey, David. Apparently, the algorithms are leading people to the show who didn't know anything about the Shakespeare authorship question, really, or, or Oxford. So this is good. We've been getting messages from people saying, this is really interesting. Um, could you maybe do a show starting at ground level and basic? And um, you know, that might be a good idea. Um, but we thought it would be a good idea to disappoint welcome newcomers to the Shakespeare authorship question and go to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship website. And right there, you'll find tons of introductory materials, including our usual member, Alex McNeil's excellent Shakespeare Authorship 101 video. It's, I think you can get it right on the front page there of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship website. And you might think of becoming a member if you join us. So, hey, Kara, hey, Tom, um, welcome everyone. Hey, Phoebe, you're back. Hey after hey. gallivanting around the world, I guess, um, showing your <laughs> film. What is that what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, traveling a bunch. Um, the film premiered in Rotterdam, which was exciting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be back to you guys. I've, I've missed the Blue Board Tower a great deal. Missed. Is it a authorship related film or is this part of your, your own it life? It is not an authorship related uh, film. Uh, <clears throat> well, Phoebe, what we're doing is... Um, can't remember were you part of this one some months ago we did a show called who are the, those guys i was yeah i was who are those guys yeah I and think tom Woosnam, real harvey right yeah that's it that's it yes and uh, tom Woosnam came up with that title from butch cassidy movie um but it was based on the idea that oxfordians hear all these names come up all the time fault greville say and but when you think about it you go well we don't know much about them as people so much as like figures floating around Edward Devere. So that was really popular doing a deeper dive into these. So we thought, uh, let's combine it with Women's History Month. Oh, it's fantastic. right now and do a ladies night version of who are those guys. Well, that's, uh, that's great to hear. It just so happens that I've been looking into Ann Vavasor and I'd, I would love to uh, bring her in for ladies night. Excellent. And there's Bonner. Hi, Bonner. Oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> nice to be here. Um, I'm looking for, I've been becoming more and more fascinated with Elizabeth Trenton lately. And so I've been on, on that tear. I have also been doing Susan Veer, but right now I'm really going strong on Elizabeth Trenton. So I'd like to have a few things to, think I have a few things I can talk to you all about. Uh, great. And to you newcomers, um, you're, you may be going, who are these people they're talking about? We'll get into that. <laughs> That's the whole point of this. And Dorothea, hi. Hello. Hey, Phoebe's back. I missed, I missed you. I'm, I'm really happy to be back. And with my favorite ladies of the Blue Board Tavern. And just so look, you know, uh, for ladies tonight at the Blue Board Tavern, admission is free. And men are Excellent. free. Are, Thank are you. welcome to attend. And the admission is the usual price, which is free as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Dorothea, wow. do you have anyone or tons of people? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can always talk about Anne Cecil. Um, I've also just done a whole bunch of research into Elizabeth Trentum, um, who is my personal favorite uh, of the women in the, in the life. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, add some other people to me. I don't think we talk enough about Oxford's sister, Mary. Um, what we know about his mother, Marjorie, is fairly minimal. Um, each one of his daughters is, is very interesting um, as well, not just Susan, but also Bess, who, you know, no big surprise, no big reveal. I don't, I don't think she is actually his blood daughter, um, but he does adopt her. So I, I would call her an adopted daughter. And the, the mystery Bridget, Bridget, who is the unloved middle child. Um, <laughs> Also, of course, you know, you've got you got people like Mary Brown, um, you've got people like um, Mary Sidney. I mean, there are all sorts of women who interact with him uh, as well as, of course, the queen herself. 
So well, I'm so excited, Dorothea. We're going to pack all this into we're gonna try. <laughs> 55 minutes. Okay. We'll have to move to part three or four or five. Who wants to start? Oh, yeah. Dorothy, well, could yeah. you tell us about, about the context? Yeah, I think, time, you know, one of, the, um, one of the things I just wanted to mention for people who aren't familiar with the Elizabethan age, you know, you think, oh, wow, there's a woman on the throne and her sister Mary was just on the throne. And that must mean that women's rights are at an all time high. <laughs> and the answer is absolutely not. Um, you may not know, for example, that unmarried women were under the control of uh, their fathers. If their fathers were deceased, it was their uncles or their brothers. They literally have no choice in whom they're going to marry unless uh, that man says that they can marry for love. Their lives are completely controlled, uh, particularly by their fathers. Disobedience is a sin. And so when you think about those scenes in the canon in Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, where Hermia is going to suffer death or a nunnery if she doesn't marry who her dad wants to, uh, that's that, not far off from what the law was uh, in Elizabethan England. Then when a woman marries, she is literally called covert, and that means she is veiled. She uh, cannot own property in her own name. She cannot enter into a contract uh, in her own name. She can do nothing without her husband's express written consent. And so the only time a woman actually becomes free to be her legal self is when she is a widow. Uh, and I think we're gonna, uh, we're gonna watch Elizabeth- That's a real perverse incentive structure. Yeah, exactly. You're going to watch Elizabeth Trentum really come into her, her own once she's a widow. But at that point, you can understand why women resisted marrying again. Uh, they may very well have had enough of husbands. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, just because it plays into this, um, some of these women we may talk about tonight may be writers. And what women could write about under their own names was also incredibly limited. There are three topics. One is translations. You're going to see the Cook sisters, which are Anne Cecil's mother and her aunts in particular, very, very well known for doing translations from religious texts in Greek and Latin. They could put those under their own names. Women could write eulogies for family members. That is an old Roman tradition and it flows through. That is permissible poetry is to write a, a song of mourning for someone who has passed. And the third thing that a woman could do uh, literarily under her own name was to write um, in praise of an important person. Uh, the person who breaks those rules is uh, Ms. Bassanio, Amelia Bassanio Lanier. She does not break the rules until 1640 and she's castigated. Uh, as a, as a uh, you know, how could she possibly have done that is the response. <laughs> in 1640, but in our time, Elizabethan and early Jacobean, uh, these are the rules the women we are talking about are going to live with. So did it, Queen Elizabeth wrote verse, right, on Monsieur's departure and, you know, quoth Elizabeth prisoner and stuff. So she's the queen, so she gets to do whatever. Or is that maybe <laughs> well, a were those really, yeah, other? were those really hers? Were there somebody else writing over her name? Are they in praise of, of in the in the praise category? I see. So you think she maybe didn't write those? She might. She might not have. You know, I mean, was it someone else using her name? You can think about in Pandora that in praise of the death of that foreign princess, which is the one poem in Pandora that has Elizabeth's name under. Did she write it? I don't know. That is a fair question. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad I asked. Actually, that's that's I always took it for granted that she she wrote all those poems, but perhaps oh, not. And maybe she said I could break the rules, too. Well, I feel like the one about um, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here, but there's, a, okay. no there's a poem that Queen Elizabeth writes about how Cupid has plucked her plumage and humiliated her. And when she was younger, she was beautiful. And then when she, you know, then she, everyone wanted a piece of her. But then I guess after her small park pox and then, you know, aging, then she's not beautiful anymore. It's hard for that doesn't feel like it's in honor of her. Like, I wonder who would have written that. And it does feel like the sentiment expressed feels very vulnerable and from her POV. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, what you've suggested is really provocative. Who wants to start? 
I guess should I should I kick it off? Okay, yes. Yeah, so go for you. Um, well, so I wanted to talk about Ann Vavasar, who's somebody that I've been interested in for a long time. Anecdotally, um, somebody on TikTok, like a 15 year old, actually like got in touch with me because he was looking her up on TikTok because he's a descendant of hers, and he's like a very posh, very funny, mischievous, uh, like <laughs> boarding school uh, teen. And so we've been in touch, and so I've been kind of. Yeah, I, I, I've also just been really interested in her in general. Um, a starting place for that was um, Earl Showerman, um, hearing him talk about um, uh, Troilus and Cressida as having been, well, all right, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So basically- oh, Can I, we start with like, yeah, the short version of what all Oxfordians know about her, like the two sentence version, and then we can sure. go in. So Anne Vavasour- um, She was his mistress. Or... She, yeah, so she, That's I almost think of her- uh, like, and I know it's annoying to come in always with the contemporary references or whatever, but I was thinking as I was looking up, reading about her life, almost like a Britney Spears style figure, <laughs> somebody who enters the scene as a teenager, very much kind of shuttled, like pushed in by kind of um, greedy relatives who think they can kind of make money or off of her. And she's uh, goes through this whirlwind and um, seems to be really... Um, there's so much schadenfreude towards Anne. People are writing nasty, vulgar poems about her even after her death. There's so much envy um, and uh, like kind of a sadistic hatred towards this young woman who shows up from a, a good family um, with, I guess, some Catholic affiliations on her mother's side at least. Um, and she shows up in as a handmaid uh, or as a bedchamber maiden in Queen Elizabeth's court when she's in her late teens. She um, has an affair with the 30-year-old married Earl of Oxford and um, ends up really uh, disgraced by it. She ends up giving birth um, in prison to his illegitimate child, whom she names after him. And then she seems to... Uh, she takes up with Sir Henry Lee, who is at the time um, the head of the, the armory and maybe in, in some ways seems to have been situated as her, her jailer, um, at least is, is how it's framed in, in certain accounts. And then she um, she kind of drops out of court life or she she doesn't seem to be on the, around Elizabeth, at least um, much after that. And, and you can kind of understand why after what she goes through. So I wanted to give an account of her life. It's unfortunate that we hear so little from her own words, but she's somebody who is um, just there. So many people are writing. There's all these tributes creatively. So I wanted to kind of tell her life story as three artistic tributes from men who are around her. And so I wanted to open with The Advice, which is a poem by uh, Sir Walter Raleigh. So this is just a snippet from it. And it's basically saying uh, it's it's cautioning her seemingly against getting involved with Edward de Vere. So many desire, but few or none deserve to win the fort of thy most constant will. Therefore, take heed. Let fancy never swerve but unto him that will defend thee still. Um, for this be sure, the fort of fame once won. Farewell the rest. Thy happy days are done. So he's kind of warning her that once she is conquered by a man, they're going to abandon her and it's, you know, it's not going to go so well. And, and he, these, this is kind of prescient advice. And if Anne had followed that advice, uh, her life might've been simpler, but literary history would have been much richer, uh, much, much, much impoverished by this. So basically um, we kind of know that she, that she takes up with, with Edward de Vere. And the second kind of artistic tribute is this massive corpus of work that Edward de Vere writes about her. Um, I think we can say that, uh, and I'm partly drawing from um, Bob Prechter's work, but I think there's many other people who've attributed um, Anne Vavasour's Echo, the poem, um, where there's a woman weeping by a bower and there's these echoes and it's like, why are you here? And it's it's Edward de Vere broke her heart. Mm -hmm. um, but also the uh, character of... Um, Beatrice in, in Much Ado About Nothing seems to have been at least partially based off of her because there's a reference to a miscarriage that's taken place in her past before the pregnancy huh. um, that shows up uh, subsequently. Um, and it's interesting because um, I saw uh, Michael Delahoy's presentation about Much Ado About Nothing, and he was arguing, I thought persuasively, that it was a big takedown of her uncle-cousin kind of relations, uh, the Howard and Arundel, um, but it's interesting because even if they're villains in Much Ado About Nothing and, you know, the Beatrice character is is wonderful. We love her so much. And so if that's based on Anne, it's interesting that um, maybe it was like a later 
uh, as he was revising it in his later years, maybe he was sort of fondly uh, reminiscing or thinking that maybe he gave an unfair portrayal of of Anne to the court. Because what you have is another play which um, comes out under John Lilly's name, which again, Bob uh, says was written by Edward de Vere, but many people for, for many decades have said that this play and Dominion, and, and sorry, yeah, and, and, and Dimion by John Lilly is um, another kind of, it's an allegorical telling, it's an apology to Queen Elizabeth basically for this uh, the fair, the fair that Oxford has with Anne Vavasor, where basically Endymion is Oxford and Tellus is this fair young handmaiden to Cynthia, obviously Queen Elizabeth. And so Tellus and Endymion sleep together. Cynthia sends Tellus and Vavasor to prison where she's supposed to weave these, uh, weave these stories of penitence, but all she's able to do is weave a portrait of Endymion's face um, maybe, uh, you know, talking about how she has his baby. And then um, after this, Tellus gets together with her jailer, Chrysides, an old knight. And then this is kind of the same story as Troilus and Cressida, which many uh, commentators have said is very misogynistic. It seems kind of out of character that Shakespeare, who seems to love women, is sort of doing a hatchet job on Cressida's reputation. And um, I really enjoyed Earl Showerman's presentation talking about how Cressida is, in fact, Anne Vavasor and the way that she sort of betrays Troilus is him kind of wanting to put the blame on her and get back into Queen Elizabeth's good graces. And then there's an, another piece, which I think many have said, which is that the Montagues and the Capulets um, seem to be uh, representing this feud that goes on for, for many years between um, Edward de Vere's camp and his servants, and then people who are from Anne Vavazor's family that are trying to defend her honor after they've seen Edward de Vere writing these nasty plays, sort of slut shaming her in front of the entire court, mocking her where everybody's sitting in the audience watching this, you know, 18 year old girl who's just given birth to his child in prison. Uh, you know, it's you have to really feel for her how awful that must have felt to have Shakespeare writing these plays, mocking you and throwing you under the bus after you were in love with this person. So I, it seems like very dark, dark days for this woman. Um, her brother, I'm trying to look for her brother's quote which I liked a lot. Yeah, so her brother tries to duel Edward de Vere and says, if thy body had been as deformed as thy mind is dishonorable, my house had yet been unspotted and thyself remained with thy cowardice unknown, which you can see where his brother would be angry that, that his sister was treated. Well, one thing that strikes me in you talking this is I've heard her name for years. I don't yeah. know it's ever struck me. She was really young. Really young. <laughs> That's why I said the Britney Spears thing. She's a teenager. Yeah, all this I is hadn't... happening. She's in this world of adults. In the middle of all this, yeah. And another feature of Troilus and Cressida in particular is that you have Pandarus, who's this creepy kind of uncle cousin figure um, who, you know, Earl was saying is based off of, uh, you know, Howard and Arundel, um, her kind of uncle cousins who kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of pimping her out. They're bringing her into court. She's this young girl. She's attractive. They're trying to see if they can foist her on some nobleman and, and you know, get make get someplace out of out of her and it's gross you do right if you're her uncle it's your responsibility to get her married to somebody right Not, right but it just unexpectedly she ends up in an affair can i just ask and add something sure uh, i wasn't affair, aware that it was raleigh who had written that poem to her i always thought it was charles her cousin charles arundel so what was raleigh's relationship with nan vavasor yeah, you know, I, I emailed back and forth with Catherine Children because I was looking for the attribution because I'd seen in multiple places yeah, the, the I was, yeah. attribution. I, mean, I didn't come across anything <clears throat> from her cousin, um, but I think it's, I, I didn't have any context for why it is that he would have written that poem. Yeah, I, it seems her. like more like a family thing to me. I mean, I could see like a cousin saying to a cousin, don't yeah. do this. Yeah, that this makes a lot good. of sense. But why Raleigh would be inserting himself into giving advice. It's got a little creep factor in it. Yeah, it is. Honestly, weird. When you said it, I was like, oh, you know, for sure. The other thing. Yeah, I just so I guess I would fast forward again to like the, the kind of the third creative tribute, which is that there's this uh, Sir Henry Lee, who she ends up kind of spending the rest of her life with. He makes this um, uh, like coat of armor that covered in love knots with her initials. And as far as I could find, we didn't really uh, I couldn't figure out what year if he'd worn it out during Ascension Day or jousting tournament or something. It'd be pretty weird to do during Ascension Day because that's obviously like the kind of propaganda holiday to celebrate Queen Elizabeth. But um I was thinking to myself from her perspective after this man who she loved, Edward de Vere, 
completely throws her under the bus and shames her also literally tries to run away when it comes out that she's given birth to him he he makes for the ports and they have to like arrest him basically he no he doesn't that's not the case no they're worried that he will walsingham says they're concerned that he will all he does is leave court there's no evidence that he actually tries to leave the country yeah. Okay. So he doesn't try to yeah, leave. The he country, doesn't actually doesn't try to leave. Like the he's country. trying to take responsibility yeah. for the the kid. And so I think after he's you know uh, um, you know smears her in front of court, the fact that Sir Henry Lee is willing to don this armor that's covered in her name all over, which is again, it's oh. it's it's not a subtle, elegant, poetic gesture, but it it certainly gets the point across. And so I think that for this young woman who's been betrayed to see that there's a man who's willing to publicly go out and take incur whatever risk to stand up for her in public, um, I think that to her is appealing. And I think that's why she sort of sees that this is the guy that she's going to kind of hitch her wagon to. Um, she has some subsequent marriages. At least one of them seems to just be for... Um, uh, putting on a public face where it's a guy who's in the employ getting like 20, 20 pounds a year from Sir Henry Lee. And so she's married to him, but he seems sort of like almost like a Shaksburg kind of mercenary kind of guy. Um, then there's, I couldn't find much about her later marriage um, to. She gets up, she's, she's big. She's charged with bigamy and find 5,000 pounds, right? Or something. Yeah. Yes. Not know. just the 5,000 pounds, but they literally say they're going to like whip her in public. Like it's going to be this corporal punishment thing. So again, this like sadistic hater energy and even Henry Lee's descendants are constantly harassing her in the courts, trying to get her um, to have to, you know, give these detailed inventories. They're accusing her of stealing linens and all this nonsense. Um, but the, you know, the cases get dropped. It seems like she was honest. Um, but basically, I think what happened is I don't know who Kate, I don't know who John Richardson, her later husband is, if that was like a love marriage, but it, um, at least a guy named Bart Casey, who I wrote a book, he thinks that basically what happens is that um, the previous husband that was being paid by Henry Lee comes out of the woodwork and thinks that he can get money out of her once Henry Lee dies. And so she kind of gets screwed again. But she's friends with, uh, with um, Anna of Denmark, who gives her a big present. And so King James intercedes and says, now, you know, we're going to we're going to find you, but we're not going to flog you in public. So that's nice. Um, let me like see. She was really treated like crap. <laughs> she was really treated. And I'm going to I'm going like to wrap all it around up with, by everyone like a pawn or something. Terrible. That's what I'm saying. Like the Britney Spears thing. So then she's buried. So Henry Lee um, uh, has a he wants to, to bury them together. So there's um, and literally there's a lewd poem that is written next to an effigy of her kneeling. So she's still alive, but he's dead. And he builds this like uh, uh, what's it called? Like a tomb for both of them. Listen to what they write next to her kneeling uh, effigy figure. Here lies good old knight Sir Harry, who loved well but would not marry. While he lived and had his feeling, she did lie and he was kneeling. Now he's dead and cannot feel. He doth lie and she doth kneel. So oh. just until like the end, people are just making really vulgar, nasty. And I think it's because she got away with it. You know what I mean? Like in the end, by the end, the fact is, yes, she's getting harassed. Yes, she's having to deal with these um you know, lawsuits and, and harassment, but she ultimately survives. And I think that there was a lot of envy towards this person. So do you, do you think that a lot of the uh, the later damage to her reputation was because she lived with Lee, but never married him in a society where that was, unless you're, you know, the Earl of Leicester, simply not done? I know I, he I mean, the devoted to her, but he never it, married her. And I don't know why. Right. Well, so it's interesting. So there's a um, Queen Elizabeth visits in 19, 1592. Uh, Elizabeth visits Henry Lee's Ditchley estate and he puts on an um, elaborate mask in which an old knight is so overcome by love that he's and he's about to die of love. But then he's rescued by the brink of death um, by the clemency of his queen. And so there's like, you know, it's one of these masks and there's a debate between constancy and inconstancy and about like, are women true? And basically at the end, um, the knight leaves the manner of love to his queen. And so it seems as though after some time goes by, it kind of feels like the whole thing blows over. And if Queen Elizabeth is going to Ditchley and, and she seems to favorably respond to this mask that Henry Lee kind of commissions and puts on to sort of justify and apologize, but still say, yeah, I'm still living with her. And it seems like if he's, you know, if he's receiving two different monarchs, it seems like people kind of got used to it. So I think it's more to do with the, the bitter air 
who was the cousin of Henry Lee, who's coming after her for the linens and the money. Um, and he has sort of legal skin in the game, um, more so than necessarily people being scandalized by her behavior, which again, seems pretty conservative. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't feel, it doesn't seem like she was even trying to gallivant in people's faces. It seems like she shows up as a teenager, you know, has this affair with an older married man, gets screwed over and thrown under the bus, finds a guy who she, who she thinks will look after her, manages to kind of build this nice partnership with him. Everyone, he always says, she's why I'm still alive. She treats me so well. She reads to me while I'm in bed. So it seems like her life was kind of tamed in that regard and people were just hating on her. I don't know. Somebody asks here, was Lee an eligible man or more of an elder guardian type? Not quite sure what that means, but. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think of him as, and I don't want it to, I know it's, I've talked forever and ever and I'm sorry, I was kind of all over the place, but um, my impression is like, he's almost like the opposite of Edward Devere in that he's, well, he just seems like he's kind of a man of action and he's a man of few words, seemingly somebody who's very stable. There were rumors that he was like a bastard child of Henry VIII. And maybe that was why he like was able to ascend so highly. He just seems well organized. He was even after he was 57 and he retires from the Ascension, Ascension J day jousts, he's still organizing them. Like he was kind of putting the events together. He seemed to have sort of like a foot in the kind of medieval chivalric world, kind of an old guard. I think she loved him. I think, I think she really loved him. And I think there was a romantic connection, which is why he made a coat of armor with her initials all over it. And they never had any kids, right? No, no yes, I did. They do. Yeah, yeah, they do have early, kids. Yeah. Early in their relationship, she had uh, her second illegitimate son. His name is Thomas. He went by Thomas Vavasor and then eventually added on the name Freeman. I have a question. Who got the money once this bigamy thing rolls? After he's, after good old Sidney uh, Henry Lee is dead. And then, and of course, she's just harassed by this. His, he didn't, he had three children from his, from his marriage to Ann Paget. And she had died in, in 1590. And that's when he, I, I gather that they had already been an item, but they don't say that. He, she starts to officially live with him in 1590. And his three children from that marriage are gone. So he has no direct heirs. And at the end, when he is dying to get it to, to write his will, and which he did a few years before he died, to give her everything that he wanted to give her, he set her up very, very well with a very uh, good, uh, secure financial position in her widowhood. So she really did well from the situation but uh he was uh i've kind of it, but the, this he had to go back way in his ancestry to find the heir to give it to so the person who got the money from his estate and inherited everything that didn't go to Anne through her jointure was not really a close friend or a close relative and then the heir apparently started this series of horrible lawsuits just uh, and they, there's a, a record in the one of the biographies of Sir Henry Lee called the depredations of Anne Vavasor because oh, she oh, didn't yeah. have and that's such an ugly way to look at it because she had couldn't account for six sheets from one of the houses she had she was supposed to give an inventory but it was just a lot of little picky petty terrible stuff but then the uh, the heir struck, struck pay dirt apparently she got remarried to this John Richardson that is not identified. Um, E.K. Chambers tried to f find him and has several possibilities, but we don't really, I don't, I, I don't understand that because she should have known. She did have an official marriage to John Finch and she never got a divorce. And then the John Finch person, after 20 years of living with Henry Lee and another bunch of years, it's around uh, 1618. So Lee's been dead and gone for a long time. And then the, her first husband, the husband shows up, which I think he was put up to by the heir. Yeah, I think Finch was, was in it for the money. Who got the money? Who got the money from the, when she had to cough up the 2,000 pounds? It's a lot of money. the air, right? I was, I've wondered that because I don't think anybody actually, I, I'm going to try to get my researcher in England to see if she can get some of uh, some of that uh, information from that. Some combination of like the heir and King James or something? So I, I would, I don't know. I just, I have no idea. I'm curious about that. Main, mainly the heir was, just, I'm sure he brought on the law, the suit for bigamy. But why did she do that? She was a smart woman too. Yeah, I mean. I'm, 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 no, can I, I'm going to jump in just. Okay. We've oh. got a half hour left. <laughs> we can do the whole time on this. <laughs> so so can we do a quick wrap up on her or if needed? Actually, or I just like to point to out, next. I mean, I just like to point out that Oxford didn't entirely hate on her because as John Lilly, he also wrote Sappho and Fail which was the predecessor 
uh, play in which, uh, you know, the queen falls in love with a handsome fairy man, right? On Ortigia, uh, but he is in love with Sappho and he has this wonderful line where uh, he has Sappho threaten to lead uh, the queen in chains like a captive. So the first play that he writes is very pro Anne and anti Elizabeth Tudor. Then wow. he has to undo it because holy cow, Elizabeth Tudor is very aware who wrote the play. Yeah. Um, I think that the play that you mentioned is the oops, sorry, your royal highness. Yeah, the endymion. <laughs> well, you know, it's I know we're wrapping up. I think sorry, I'm I I feel like I did it all out of order, but you know, it's interesting, even when I was saying with like with Howard and Arundel, um I I he seen, you know, the fact is he denounces them for Catholic conspiracy around Christmas. And then in March is when it's announced it's just people find out that Anne's pregnant. And so he looks really bad. Devere looks really bad because, you know, three months ago he's saying, oh, you guys are really bad. You're Catholics. But then it's like, oops, I also like impregnated your cousin. And so then it looks like he's sort of uh, covering his own ass or something. Um, so it does seem like, and even it does, they, they report that even the first time she's pregnant before she has the miscarriage, he does talk about running away with her and trying to get married or something. Um, at least I read. So it yeah. seems like it was a very torrid affair with a, a lot of drama. And she dies in Paris um, in what, like 1624? How does she get to Paris? They say that, she, they say that she's like 99 or something. I don't know. She's it seems really like she, old. I mean, yeah. she's I'm older. hearing chants of Elizabeth Trentum, Elizabeth Trentum, right. Elizabeth Trentum. So I think we need to move on. And um, also little notes flying around saying, well, you know, John Lilly may not have been Edward Devere. That's, <laughs> we can't state that as fact. Um, oh, yeah. It's speculation from some okay. people that may or may not be true, but... Well, I think I think it's definitely worth discussing. Um, it, it is worth Robert discussing. Work. Anyway, yeah, let's hear about Elizabeth Trentham. Oh, and, and well, let me follow up with one more quick thing that Catherine Chilton believes, and I tend to tend to agree with Catherine, uh, that uh, the dark lady of the sonnets is Anne Vavasor, and the fair youth is the son that they had together, who, who becomes a very a competent, capable person and very well thought of in Europe. Where he's parked off, he lives at the Hague. So, and he's knighted by King King James. So, I mean, he's he had a successful life, but we might say. But uh, can I turn now to uh, to? Uh, I think I can give what what the average Oxfordian knows. I mean, not super in depth people is. It's the respectable second marriage of Edward de Vere, Elizabeth Trentham. That's what we hear. They had a legitimate son and all that. But what about her as a person? So. You tell us about her, uh, introduce her. Okay, she. Uh, this is interesting, and I've, I've been assimilating more to the facts, as uh, that Elizabeth, the queen, had over 80 ma maids of honor, or, the, or her gentlewoman women of the bedchamber and the privy chamber and all this stuff, but she only allowed 13 to get married with her permission. It's, it's often said, wow. in fact, None other than Alan Nelson in his <clears throat> uh, book uh, writes that very uh, sort of a, a not a not sort of a crack about her. On the, she was on the marriage market for at least ten years. That is just uh, he should be. I should say something bad about him for, for writing that because in fact the court of Queen Elizabeth to be a maid of honor is not where they went to get married because Elizabeth so terribly disapproved of her maids getting married. Now they did get themselves married and they wanted to get good husbands. So they went to court to serve Elizabeth, but Elizabeth only approved of 13 marriage, uh, marriages out of w probably well over 80 young women that through these 45 years went, went to court. They came from good families. They had to have that. And many of them were noble women. Young noble women were especially sought after to, to be uh, to be these maids of honor and whatever. And, and so she is, a uh, Anne goes there when she's very young, but Elizabeth is there as, as when she's probably about 20, maybe young, because they're, they're regarded as adults as, at the age of 16. We see it as so terribly young now, but, but uh, Elizabeth goes there and she is, one, as it turns out, she's going to be one of the 13 that Elizabeth approves of her marriage. And, uh, and the way he says, well, she's on the marriage market, look, but Elizabeth must have been the one, the queen. In fact, somebody has even said that possibly the queen chose Elizabeth to marry, to give Oxford a nice second marriage that would be somewhat 
more peaceful and hopefully less chaotic than his first marriage and his affair. But at any rate, it's fun, funny because four of those 13 marriages are for Oxford and his family. One is, is his marriage to Anne, she approves, her first, Anne Cecil, that is. She approves of that. She approves of, of Elizabeth Trenton, and she approves of, of Elizabeth Veer marrying the Earl of Derby, and she approves of Bridget Nor marrying Lord Norris, Lord Rycote. So she has approved. That's not too many. I mean, it was really tough to go to court to find yourself a good husband, which actually it worked out well for her. And somewhere I ran across, and I can't remember where, that on two occasions, Elizabeth sent noble women who were well married to be her surrogates at baptisms, where she was serving as godmother, because she couldn't go to be the, in, the, in the official uh, ceremony. And one was, was Elizabeth Trenum, by which point she's the Countess of Oxford. And then she also sent the wife of uh, the uh, Tower, the Earl of Nottingham, who was her, her admiral during the, her, the hero of the Spanish Armada stuff. So Elizabeth thought extremely well of, of Elizabeth, Queen, the Queen Elizabeth thought extremely well of Elizabeth Trenton. So I, I, and that seems to be her historical reputation is that she was more or less as, as, as good, as respectable as one could possibly be. And she, of course, but something I ran across, and uh, if, uh, Dorothea probably knows this, but uh, when, after, when they, they, that exact time is before they got married, uh, this wonderful researcher in England, his name is Jeremy Crick, found this out when he was trying to track the Tritum family and her subsequent generations, because as she moved and then the, the he, he assumes, or at least thinks it's, it's plausible, that a lot of Oxford's materials and writings and literary stuff was was at King's Place. And she sold King's Place. And in 1609, she made a tremendous life change. She sold King's Place. She bought Castle Headingham and that and moved her act, moved herself to Castle Headingham. And then apparently was also had a London home on Cannon Row. So those were according to one person I've read. That's where she lived. But the interesting thing, this is in 1609. This is a major life change. She also had to communicate with his three daughters because in 1609, they owned Castle Hedingham because the father had to give the, the great country castle to the country home to, uh, well, they didn't call it home, it's a castle to his daughters. So that puts her communicating with his daughters, which puts her in a wonderful opportunity for whether whose idea it was, but 1609 happens to be the year that the sonnets are published. It happens to be the year that Trollius and Cresta, which is a, it's been mentioned before, uh, is, is published with that extremely uh, tantalizing preface that grand possessors have these plays. And of course, we, we'd love to, to speculate on who the grand possessors are, but I think, it, I think that Elizabeth Trenum is in the mix of this thing. He absolutely is. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I, that's what I think. But when I forgot to, I was about to go, but, but it's interesting. This is a new fun fact that I learned in Crick's articles in the Devere's uh, newsletter that Francis gave, her brother, Francis Trenton, gave Oxford 10,000 pounds. That's a huge amount of money before they married. Now we're talking back in at the end of 1591, uh, in the, which is kind of when we don't have a record of them getting married, but they were definitely married. Uh, most people think by the end, by December of 1591. And, uh, and Francis Trenton, who I, I believe, and I, uh, we've just talk about this, Dorothy, you may disagree, but I yeah. think Francis, <laughs> I, I think that Francis was serving him as something of a position of a financial advisor because he wanted to see his sister do well financially. And she, the real problem with Oxford is his everything with his life has been in chaos. His finances have been in chaos. He's been losing. He sold off all his properties. And part of the deals the Trenton family wishes to use, they have been very uh, upwardly mobile in accumulating properties. And he had uh, the father had served as a, a sheriff. And they'd been reasonably prominent in the social life of their shire. And I believe that he was going to help Oxford to reassemble the earldom and that his, I'm sure they were both in, in it, but I do believe Francis was, they, everything I read about Francis is he had the ability to do this. Uh, he, and before the marriage, he gave Oxford 10,000 pounds. Now this is in Crick's article, which I'm sure you read, uh, but people who are new to this, people who are new to this have not read this. And yeah. in fact, 
crit in the article even shows, I don't know if this can be, but this is the, does it show up on me? This, this, yeah, yeah. This, uh, Honor. Yeah, this is the document of the 10,000 pounds that he's giving to Oxford before they marry. And what he wants is to be, to get the rights to Castle Hanningham in reversion if the marriage does not produce an heir. If his Honor. marriage is sister. Honor. Yes. What do you think a man is going to say, right? He's going to give all the credit to another man. <laughs> well, no, I, I do. I do I agree know, with you. Yeah, I have a totally different way of looking at that well, that real well, estate transaction. Well, but go she, ahead. Yeah. She votes well. We've got some letters from from after she becomes right. the, the widow, and we have some letters, and she she writes very clearly. Um, I'm going to see if my researcher can actually. We have transcripts of them, but because I'd like to see her handwriting, I'm sure it's lovely penmanship. But uh, I just like to eyeball the the letters that she wrote to Cecil. Uh, but but the family, I would see them working together. I was not necessarily see her because her brother does seem to have a re rather good resume for being a good, and the whole family were good business people. The other two daughters married well. I mean, you and right. every but, year but, she cannot, before she is married, she has oh. no legal power. Only no, her no, brother no. can act for her because her father is deceased, right? right. I understand that. Right? Yeah. So what they did, and I think it's actually Oxford and to some extent Elizabeth, I think where Crick is um, missing some pieces, um, Francis Trentham had 13 children and with his wife. And the <laughs> properties they owned were sheep farms and corn mills. The properties that Oxford invested in were very profitable commercial properties, if you will, in 16th century parlance in and around the city of London. So because Oxford had been fleeced by the ward system, what someone created, and I don't think it was Francis Trentham, I actually think it was Oxford, is a combination of a corporation or an LLC to hold the real estate. The money partner comes in, which is Francis Trentham, which is where that $10,000 come. Mm -hmm. The properties go into Elizabeth's name with the family lawyer and Francis Trentham. So that when Oxford dies, nothing goes through probate and nothing that belongs to him goes into the ward system to be further fleeced. So it's a combination of a mortgage, a property holding entity, an LLC or a corporation, the mortgage coming from Francis Trentham, he's the banker, um, mm -hmm. a trust, the way we think of trust, these concepts do not exist in early modern England, and um, a, a, a way of working around probate as it stands and a way of taking care of any future male heirs. And I guarantee you, Francis Trentham did not put all that together, even though Crick thinks he did. I think the person who put it together was a combination of the lawyer and Oxford and Elizabeth Trenton. Well, yeah, all that's what I thought coming through here. Uh, um, yeah, I can. So one, one, is, very important. one is, is that it sounds like this was a good marriage in terms of sort of getting yeah. the earldom back on track right. in a way. And obviously um, he couldn't, obviously Oxford couldn't do it by, do it by himself. You know, yeah, he, he did for him. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Trenum's had a very good lawyer, a man who's known as John John Wright of Gray's Inn, and he is one. He, he's something. It's just there's something in this will. And do I have time yet to, to go over a couple of little tiny things? I could talk the rest of the time about this will of Elizabeth Trenum, but there's something in this will that is just of staggering significance. Okay. In fact, there's a bunch of stuff, and in the context of the will, it's of staggering significance. She she is very thorough. Uh, Elizabeth Trenum, as she is dying, probably in November, she's going to die in, uh, at the end of 1612. And she's very thorough in giving legacies to the people who work for her and to all of her, her cousins and relatives that she truly liked. And she gives a huge amount of money to John Wright of Gracie, and who's one of the executors. And, uh, and, and, and then John Wright is going to do something very interesting. He is supposed to pay a person called My Dumb Man during a yearly during his life, and she doesn't name who the dumb man is. And I looked up dumb in the historical thesaurus. Dumb does have non-speaking, has that, because dumb can carry many different connotations, but it's someone who doesn't speak, who is mute. But she doesn't say who it is, which I, I, it's very rare in a will 
that you don't name the person and make it very clear who the person to get the money is. But then she leaves blank the amount of pounds. So she's not named the person to get this money. She's not so, so, so how much money he is. And it, then it's to be paid to him quarterly. And that's significant in four, the four times that this feast were normally quartered. Norm, quarterly indicates that this is a very serious amount of money. It's a fairly large amount of money. We don't know how much because she doesn't say. But when money is being paid quarterly, that's a, a good indicator that it is a lot of money because it has to accumulate through the year. They don't have it that much money in hand to give. Everything else in the will goes immediately in full. So why is she paying a dumb man money? And she, it's to be paid to her by her executor, who actually her brother's one of the executors, along with John Wright, who is, as I said, a tremendously accomplished attorney. So you got some smart people and they this will is, and is really, and John Wright is one of the witnesses of the will too. So, Something's going to occur to me because she names all that she has a lot of people who work for her, or just servants, as we call them, as they would call them. I don't think this dumb man's a servant. It's somebody who's not going to speak, who's doing something. And really actually, that would very important for her estate. And it's going to go yearly. It's in for those four quarter pay quarterly during his life and go on for the rest of his life. And John Wright's going to take care of that. Golly. Wonder who he was. Uh, well, John Wright was a very well respected attorney. Not him, the dumb man. Oh, the dumb man. Right, right. But Wright was the attorney for the court for the uh, House of Commons. Yeah. How it placed and very well respected and all that good stuff. But, but this is, I have, a, of the 3,000 wills that I have read through year after year, trudging my way along, I've never seen a clause like that. Not that, and, and that's, it's shocking. Something is, the game's afoot somewhere, and it mean, actually might tend to back up what Dorothea said. You mean not everyone at the time had a dumb man that they were giving lots of money? No, to <laughs> I haven't seen one. Oh, Before we I'm move on. Go, oh, oh, excuse me. Yes. Oh, okay. I just want to say that time is always taken away here. Before we move on, a couple of people, and I know, Bonner, you especially, you're big on portraits. Somebody said uh, one factor with Elizabeth Trentham is she was a Countess of Oxford 21 years and not a portrait was painted of her. That's troublesome. Uh, I think you know there, there is, or not, or? I think there is a portrait. So I think I have located a portrait of her that's just been mischaracterized and I'm not quite ready to come out with it yet. But the reasons are um, that her will contains descriptions of clothing and in particular jewels that are very specific that she leaves mm -hmm. to Henry. And there is a portrait that has a provenance um, that is to me picks up pretty clearly um, when it came out of Brookhouse and the jewels on the lady match her will. So Ooh, it's exciting. point I may pull that out. I don't know if I can, if I, how quickly I can get to it, but if I can. Next week. Uh, next week. Yeah. <laughs> along with everything else. Yeah. I've been well, looking for her for a while. Like sort of. Yeah. I've been looking for her for a long, long oh, Okay. Is, well, that relates maybe to this other thing someone brought up about misrepresented portraits. Oh, yeah. Somebody had asked, and I don't, I don't know about this, throw it out here saying the Ashbourne portrait of Shakespeare came down through her family. Yes. You know, it, it, so it did. Yeah. Okay. It came, it, it's been tracked by a number of people who've traced it that uh, because it, it, in one of the houses uh, it, it's in an inventory that sounds, of, and it's pretty clearly there describing okay. the Ashbourne and it's, uh, it's the Earl of Oxford. So this portrait of Shakespeare comes from um, Edward de Vere's widow. And I read this somewhere and I was looking for it to refresh my memory. And maybe you could do it. But I was going back into the Rasmussen's book on the first folios. A lot of people track them down that a number of first folios can be, as I go, get tracked into antiquity, were owned by various sundry members of the Tritum family. So I don't know if that's true. I want to go back and, get, yeah. and go over it again. So those of you who are hearing, hearing us out there, you yeah. may source because there are uh, various other sources, and I just didn't have time to uh, to to go back into that and refresh my memory. I and think so exactly. 
what, what her three falcon, about. her three griffins appear at some point under those layers and layers and layers of paint in the Ashburn. They've been, you know, obliterated. Yeah. Griffins. Yeah. 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 The painting, yeah. Uh, somebody, Roger, thank you, Roger. The painting uh, went from Wentworth Wodehouse, where it was in an inventory, to Ashburn. Yes. So uh, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, gonna, 10 minutes, we might be able to go five over tonight or something. So, well, then we better, stick with Elizabeth. we better stick with Elizabeth Trentum because I don't think we're going to have time to cover Anne Cecil at all. People are saying we need to do a part two of Ladies <laughs> Night. And we do. Um, there's a video out there on Anne Cecil that you guys can see if we don't, if we don't get to her, but I mean, something guys, some things I'd like to talk to about Elizabeth Trenton in addition okay. to all the Go stuff that, that Bonner has, uh, has uncovered is to realize, uh, what an incredible sense of humor and how very gutsy and outspoken she was after Oxford died in these beautiful letters that Bonner is talking about. She mm -hmm. has a tremendous amount of fun with the most dangerous man, and that's not her words, that is somebody else's words, the most dangerous man in England, who is Robert Cecil. Robert Cecil was by the brother of Oxford's first wife, Anne Cecil, that we're not going to have time to talk about, but go see the video. Um, and she has so much fun with him. He writes her after Oxford has passed away, and she is a widow, so she responds back directly that there is all this money owed. Her son owes money. She owes money. Oxford's estate owes money. Where is the money? Where's the money? He's treasurer. And this is what her husband's brother-in-law writes her. And she writes back and she says, I would be pleased to pay the money that I personally own, except for that my name is Elizabeth, not Anne, as you've written it. So she just tweaks him like, you don't even know the difference between your sister's name and mine, flat out. Two, mm, that bit that you think my son owns, actually, that is the debt of his grandfather. And underneath the law, my son is not responsible for the debt of his grandfather. And for this other amount you say my son owes, please prove to me whether that is my husband's debt or his grandfather's debt. And by the way, you say that my husband's estate owes you 29 pounds. My husband's estate owes you exactly 20 pence. And here is the rec you know, reckoning for it. I love this woman, right? She just so, smacks Well, it him sounds like for somebody who got shoved into this world when she was so young, she really learned to play the game. Well, her father, it's interesting when you read her father's will. I mean, one thing I want to say about Elizabeth Trenum, and I want to say it loud and clear, would you please stop calling her a rich Oh, era. it's like an end that. Yes, that's but, true. You know, Elizabeth brought, yes. Elizabeth brought 1,000 pounds under her father's will, which uh, would be paid in four installments, okay, which is of 250 pounds a year, if um, it was paid out in the first four years after her father died, otherwise the money went to her. A thousand pounds, while it is what Oxford received from the queen, is not a tremendous amount of money. During no. this time, Oxford was selling properties left, right, and center, consolidating them, in my opinion, selling the ones that are far out in the country and need a lot of repair and a lot of money and investing the money. I actually think I was a commercial real estate lawyer for 35 years. So when I look at Oxford's portfolio, I see a man that's making really smart business decisions with real estate, which is contrary to what a lot of other people think. But but as this as he sells these other properties, he's selling them for 2,500 pounds here, 500 pounds there. So anyway, 30,000 pounds, if that's an heiress, a thousand pounds is not an heiress. She's a, it's a nice middle-class girl's dowry. And Cecil brought 3,000 pounds. So even compared to that, Elizabeth is not this super rich girl that's going to rescue Oxford. So forget it. Um, I'm, I'm, let me say that I'm glad you straightened that out because yeah, it, I mean, it, I have to say that she wasn't, she was not a, it wasn't really a mercenary marriage. Uh, necessarily, unless the, the Trenton family uh, joined in, the, and, which they apparently did, to be to, to a brother, to, yeah, to a brother, and yeah, ten thousand pounds is getting is looking a little better, but that came from Francis Trenton. 
Right, but he was getting something for it. As I said, it was yes, a, yes he was getting a business deal for him. It wasn't a gift. It was a, really a business deal. It, it was a business uh, deal. on behalf of his sister. But you know, I mean, looked at another way, her father in his in her father's will, and her father was one of the guys who was responsible for Mary Queen of Scots. That's actually what 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 Thomas Trentham rose through the ranks was he happened to be um, sheriff of the county and Castorum Roliolum, if I'm saying that correctly, he ended up having Mary Queen of Scots under his uh, his watch and bringing her to Fondering So um, that's actually what brought Trentham and he was a, in uh, in the parliament and so forth. But um, she, uh, you know, she comes from this sort of Midland area, um, not from a noble family. She's a commoner, again, like Oxford's mother, like Anne Cecil. Um, and she comes with a huge amount of common sense. But her father had two wards who were his brother's children. And, uh, of course, the boy, Francis, there's a younger son, Thomas, who um, who dies uh, too young in his 20s, but still tragically. Anyway, Francis is set up first to do everything under the will, but in case Francis can't or won't, the father names Elizabeth, particularly in connection with the being carrying the wardship of these two cousins of hers. So I read into that a father, and she has two other sisters too. So I, I read into that a father who has a tremendous amount of faith in his daughter uh, and thinks very well of her head and how she conducts herself. And she says... In one of her letters um, after Oxford's death, she says, so she's trying to get Hedingham back, <clears throat> says, you know, I really don't need or care that much for things that cost a lot of money. I can live very economically. Well, Sounds like a very grounded person. But one of the things in her will, she sure was a very well-dressed person because her clothes That's cost good. a lot. And she had jewels. And when you see all that she's distributing to all of them and read them, which I know you've done carefully. So uh, she she wasn't living in poverty by any means. I have, a, I have like, a question from myself here, um, but also first I'll just say some people are saying, Here's a new project for you, Dorothea. Um, we need What's Dorothea that? to write a more realistic assessment of Oxford's land investments. Yeah. Somebody uh -huh. says he, he knew how to handle lots of data and analyze it. So uh, could you start on that maybe week after next after you week do the after next. Project? Well, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it's it's a it's a different it's a different way of looking at him. You know, so much of what we get has come from his enemies mm -hmm. and the Phrases just get tossed out like, oh, Elizabeth Trentham was an heiress. Um, it is simply not true, you know, when you start to look at it. All of us, um, we get <clears throat> into the easy answers, but you have to look very carefully. But, he, you know, he inherited a bunch of literally small dogs and cats all over the country. Even Henningham, which was in terrible shape, everyone blames him for it. But if you look at it from the time his father, Earl John, died, the people that owned and had responsibility for Headingham for uh, Lester for 17 years, the Queen for 11 years, and his good old father-in-law, William Cecil Lord Burley, for about 15 years. So Oxford really only had control and responsibility of Headingham for about eight or 10 years of his life. And all of this damage had happened because no one else was repairing it. And property gets to a point where it's past repair. And that was the situation with Headingham. Another tiny little snippet of like, Sir Henry Lee, um, he is gifted like hundreds of feudal slaves by Queen Elizabeth, like serfdom. So I think there is like this sort of, on. Uh, we don't talk enough about the fact that there was this sort of serfdom uh, culture that was there. And also Henry Lee made a lot of money because he was part of the movement that was starting to parcel off land. Um, so that you were, so that for sheep grazing. So it went from like, a, I think more of like a pastoral yeah. agricultural freer sort of thing. And then it starts getting siphoned off. So he really won big on that. So it seems like maybe Edward de Vere wasn't investing in this more, um, th this way of kind of extracting more value from the, the sheep and also like serfs. I don't know. It, it sounds too, I mean, we haven't got touched on this really personal aspect. Uh, is there any sense of their relationship, Oxford and her, as people? Because it sounds like 
he was really grounded and could have been really good for him in that sense. And But do we have any sense of how they got along? There's that beautiful poem that we don't know who wrote, but it sure looks like he does, where he takes her last name and runs the uh, letters of it right down the far left margin and then starts every line with a letter. And um, he says, you know, he, he talks about mutual respect. He talks about a proven truth. I could read the poem, but we're probably out of time. In the final line, he says, more fair than she who was the, I think it's pride of youth. Someone's going to look it up uh, and correct me, except but one, the, the, the same <laughs> The equal was never seen or words to that effect. I'm, I'm messing it up, but it's this beautiful line that plays on the two Elizabeths. It talks about her having been 10 years in service to the queen, putting mm -hmm. on the queen's makeup. Um, it's uh, it's, it's a tough job, poem, but I, it's got to be a love match. I mean, I, I don't think it it could really be anything else. And the long period of time where they're putting together this uh, combination, corporation, mortgage, um, bypassing probate and protecting uh, the properties of the earldom for the next heir, uh, who's Henry. Um, that takes months and months and months. I mean, so somebody was, uh, and I think it's all parties were being very careful that once this marriage took place, there wasn't gonna be any more pilfering of the de Vere uh, fortune and the de Vere lands. <laughs> Uh, Michelle says, I think it allowed him time and space to finish his later amazing oh, things. Of course. He had a, yeah, a centered course. life mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And that's that's actually Elizabeth's greatest uh, achievement. We would not have the Shakespeare canon without Elizabeth Trentum, in my opinion. I agree mm -hmm. totally. I'll, 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 I'll oh, one more thing, Bonner, and then I'll wrap up. But don't, <laughs> go for it, Bonner. But... Oh. Yep, you had I, I just said I was, I was giving her my, I love the way she said that. I love that, uh, Dorothea. That's a good wrap up line, I think, here, if ever I heard one, um, especially for Women's History Month, which it is. A um, few comments here. Just somebody says um, on Ladies Night, we should have a cheer for our presenters. I oh. agree with that. Everyone, oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, may you enjoy the praise you'd like to hear, the recognition you deserve, and the dignity you inherently own. Other people are saying, we need to do another one of these because we didn't get to half the people. We didn't get to all the people we promised you. I know, this is what happens. I'm go away. So uh, so we will put on our on our list, um, doing another ladies night, perhaps next March, perhaps earlier than that. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. And okay. thank you to all our guests. Thank you to our future YouTube visitors. And um, more. And we are planning a part three of who are those guys already um, <laughs> with some interesting names coming up. So stay tuned. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Jonathan. Bye-bye. Bye everybody. Thanks for the Bye. free drinks, Jonathan. Oh, Thanks Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks. Happy ladies night. You're welcome. Mm.